Hello, welcome back to Suspended Fanimation. I am your host, Dennis Bethulkus, and today is National Bourbon Day. Hooray! No, actually, <laughs> it is National Bourbon Day, but it's also Swamp Thing, Season 1, the only season, Episode 3, He Speaks. And welcome, everybody. Uh, hopefully you have your bourbon in hand. I do. Uh, right there. So, yes, uh, enjoy. Hey, Viking bitch, how's it going? I take a little sip of my bourbon there. Yes, very bourbony. Well, actually, my whiskey, I should say, my rye whiskey that I got going on. Um, it's not Jack Daniels for a change. I know everyone uh, always, you know, chides me on that, but uh, I got something more a little local this time around. And no, it's not from a still or moonshine. Well, it could be, but it was being sold at Costco. I was not aware. I have no bourbon. I understand, Viking bitch. I wasn't aware of it either until some app told me it was, and I looked it up. I'm like, oh, what do you know? It is a National Bourbon Day. Kind of nice. So uh, I'm going to do this in the beginning because normally I do it at the end. But if you like what you see here, hit the subscribe button. Also hit the like button. It's right down here below. If you don't like it, you can hit the dislike button. I just asked you to go down below in the comment section. Tell me what it is you don't like. Give me some constructive criticism. None of this, you suck, or you're ugly, or you smell funny, which I don't know how you're smelling me through the fucking computer, but hey, that's your own thing. Um, just give me some constructive criticism. There we go. And uh, dang, and here I am with gin. Hold on, I'll be right back. Going for the bourbon. You, you shouldn't mix your colors. You know that, Pen Farm Girl. You really shouldn't do that. Hey, Joe. How's it going? I saw that you were in here earlier. Yes. Uh, a good excuse to drink. Not that we need one. Exactly. Exactly. So before I get started here, spoiler alert, I am going to spoil the shit out of the episode. If you haven't seen the episode, go and watch it. This will be a video. You can come on back and you can comment down below in the comment section. There we go. Thank you, Viking bitch, for the paddle. There we go. And yes, I'm going to say that forever, pretty much, uh, Viking bitch and probably gonna thank you forever for that you know for the for the paddle so well um you know season three or excuse me season three season one episode three uh it was pretty damn good it wasn't it wasn't bad um and it, you know the thing is it's it's staying steady that's the whole thing and uh it's got good quality to it but you could tell they pumped a lot of money into it and that's the reason why this thing got canceled uh, they pumped way too much money into it. They were expecting a lot more money back from their tax breaks, and they didn't get it. So, unfortunately, hey, uh, Penn Clark and Bellamy are married in real life from the 100. Oh, okay. I don't watch the show. Sorry. I tried, and I just I couldn't get into it. It was very too YA for me. And I'm way past the YA age. So, yes, uh, even though I watch Supergirl, you know, yeah. Um, <laughs> so we open up with a campfire in the woods and we see a shoeless Alex walking through the woods and who shows up but Munson, the guy who uh, Alec had ripped apart earlier that we, you know, in the last episode. And um, he's like, yeah, so what's your do? What you know, what are you doing here? And he goes, what are you doing here without any shoes? And then he goes, uh, you're too much of a pretty boy to be out here in the woods by yourself and all this stuff. And then he goes, do you remember me? And he goes, you don't remember me, do you? And Alex, like, should I? And he's like, you killed me. And he starts strangling him. And he says, and I'm coming back, is what he says. And we see Alec kind of start, you know, awaken as Swamp Thing. You know, he's there again. And so this is a, um, all in his head, of course, at this point in time. And... Um, we start seeing him trudge off into the swamp and we see the swamp start actually pulling the pieces of Munson back together again. And we see his hand clench, his severed hand kind of clench. Abby in the meantime is over at Liz, at Liz's place. And she's telling Liz about this guy that she found out in the swamp that was covered in vines and uh, plants and everything like that. And, that Susie was drawn to this guy to help him. And that Susie told her that the guy told her his name was Alec. And Liz is like, Oh, fuck me. That's what she says. 
kind of thing. She goes, have you told anybody else? And Liz is like, no, I'm, I haven't. I don't think anyone would believe me kind of thing. And she looks down on her phone and goes, oh, shit, I got to go. And she goes to the hospital and the CDC has called in uh, another team, specifically her supervisor, Eli, who we saw just a little bit of in the first episode was kind of a dick. And he actually is a big dick, pretty much. And he's there to, uh, you know, take over things because things aren't moving as quickly as they'd like. And also she finds out that Woodrow is there as well. Jason Woodrow is there and he's downstairs doing an autopsy, of course, on Susie's dad, Eddie Coyle. So she goes down to the morgue and sees Woodrow cutting him up and he pulls out a heart and he says, what, what do you make of this? And so she starts answering what she sees, everything there. And uh, she asks him, is this a test? And uh, he says, no, he goes, I just want to see what people, basically he, he condescends to her and uh, basically tells her that she doesn't know what she's talking about kind of thing. Uh, being a dick like we've already seen him being. Uh, he's he's very elitist, is what he is. And then she goes off and says, what I see is a man who is trying to raise his own, you know, uh, a single parent trying to raise his daughter under the best, uh, worst of circumstances and end up getting sick and dying and all this stuff. And he goes, that's what you look at. You look at the human condition. I take the human condition out of this and emotion out of it. And I look at it as survival of what, ha what, ha what is happening here. Yeah, Kevin Durand is out of character, but at the same time, he's actually playing a really good character here, Joe. He's actually playing this dispassionate um, scientist, if you will. I've seen some of these, you know, before in, in real life. And uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I, I can totally say that this kind of person does exist in real life. Uh, but Kevin Durand is doing a really good job right here. And uh you know, he's he's gotten older and stuff like that. And this is one of the roles I, I, I'm seeing him mature into, which is actually kind of nice. Uh, he used to play kind of the dumb hick, you know, the, the muscle, if you will, or blob in, uh, you know, Logan, that kind of thing. And to see him play this kind of character is actually a lot better now. It's kind of nice to see him grow into that. So he's there, of course, on Avery Sunderland's dime. And... Uh, you know, he is, of course, uh, uh, looking at it from a different perspective than Abby is at this point. So Liz, in the meantime, goes to talk to Gordon uh, Haas, who is part of the bank there. And she's been trying to track him down. And she goes, uh, so what's going on? Uh, there's there's supposed to be some loans that are going on off the books in to Avery Southern, Sunderland. And she wants to know a little bit about it. And, of course, he's been dodging her. And, of course, he doesn't want to talk about it. So then we see uh, Lucia Cass, uh, Cable, excuse me, calls in her son, Matt, who's also a, uh, in the sheriff's office there and wanted to see how the investigation was going into robotized death. And so he fills her in on her, all this stuff and what happened out there. And she says, damn it, you know what? You should have followed procedure. She goes, I'm pretty sure Abby being in town is clouding your judgment. Otherwise, you would have followed procedure. She basically chews him out. And then he asks, well, what the hell's going on with the investigation and Alex's death? And they said, well, we don't know if it's an, if it was an explosion, you know, if it was uh, malicious or if it was an accident. So if we don't hear anything back from Avery, Avery Sunderland uh, in a couple of days, we're going to rule it as an accident. So that's how they're doing it at this point. Uh, Viking Bitch says, this show could have been a real career booster for lots of older actors had it lasted. Hopefully this will look good on the resume. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you, Viking Bitch. This is actually a, a really good showcase of actors that have been around before all these character actors that are getting a good uh, you know a, a different take on things if you will kevin duran um god the guy's playing avery sunderland virginia madsen who's in there jennifer beals uh even ian Ziering. uh all these people are actually having really good roles in this thing. And they're all accomplished actors. They have been in different things. Well, not maybe Ian Ziering. He's been in some really bad shit. This is kind of redeeming him a little bit more. But um, yeah, it's it's there's a lot of yeah, Patton, exactly. Thank you, Joker. Uh, so yeah, it's it's very good for them. And at the same time, it's very bad that this has been canceled because this was something that was meaty, something that had some teeth to it. And uh, no pun intended on that, but, you know, it's, it's, it, 
the material is actually fairly dense and is actually really good. Are you disparaging the genius of Sharknado? Uh, which one? One, two, three, four, or five? Has five come out yet? Yeah, I didn't watch. Uh, I think I watched a bit of the first Sharknado and I was like, oh my God, no. I can't do this. Yeah, I can't do this to myself. <clears throat> so Abby checks in on Susie to find out, uh, you know, how she's doing. And Harlan had been up all night with her, we find out. And she goes to go check on Harlan. And he's, she turns him around in the chair and he's got the green crap going on on him. He's sick and he apologizes to her. He goes, yeah, I know I'm not supposed to get sick kind of thing, but it happened. And he starts coughing up green shit and then convulses and goes to the floor. So she calls a cold code blue. They bring in the crash pads and Eli runs in and basically yells at her to get away. So. Yeah, so Abby decides at this point that she's going to break into Alex's lab. <laughs> you know, the, the lab has been cordoned off by the uh, police and find out what the hell he found out. And so she goes out to the docks with Liz and her girlfriend, Margot, and jumps on a skiff and takes off. And Liz actually tells Margot, she goes, if you see any pieces of Alex's boat out there, just kind of keep an eye out if you're out at Skeeter's Cove. If you see any piece of the boat, let me know. And she goes, okay, well, yeah, I, I will. I'll take a look at it. Which, of course, we know she is going to find it because that's, you know, your characters wouldn't mention it if it's not going to be part of the plot. <clears throat> so we see a hunter out in the woods, and he's uh, hunting for boar at this point. And he hears loud squealing going on and goes to investigate. And he sees this dead boar with all these insects all over. And he turns around just in time to see Munson, whose body is pieced back together, shambling up behind him and his mouth opens up and all these insects come flying out straight into that guy's mouth. So we know that he's dead at this point. Um, Woodrow in the meantime is telling his wife about the mutation and that it's not just the accelerant, but something about the land itself, the swamp itself that's adding to it. And she's taking some pills uh, at the time and uh, she's actually agreeing with him and, and saying, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And then she looks back down and she goes, honey, where are my pills? Uh, my pills I just put out here on the countertop. And he goes and says, you just took them. And we find out that her memory is failing. So she has uh, some kind of disease, possibly Alzheimer's, where she is starting to forget things. And this is what's pushing him, is to find a cure for what's going on to her as well. Uh, Viking bitch, does Swamp Thing speak in the comics? I wasn't expecting to be able to speak. Yes, he does. He does speak in the comics. So, and yes, the eighties, uh, swamp, swamp thing movie with Adrian Barbeau is fucking awesome. Uh, um, Louis, uh, God, uh, I can't remember his, his name now. The guy who played the villain, um, he is awesome in it. He is absolutely, I mean, he chews up scenery like you would not believe. And it's, it's one of the best movies. I haven't seen it in a long time. I'm probably, you know, looking at it with nostalgia mo most likely, but it was still a lot of fun. It was a, it was a really fun movie. It was a lot better than it had to be. So, ah, uh, yes. So Avery, in the meantime, tells Maria that Abby uh, should be gone soon, that she'll be back to her old self. And uh, she goes, well, that's just it. I am back to my old self. And uh, she says, I've been faking this for 14 years. I've been trying to, uh, force myself to be somebody that I'm not. She goes, but I'm coming back to my old self now at this point. And before they can get into it further, uh, Gordon Haas has shown up uh, unexpectedly and unannounced and is not going to leave. He wants to talk to Avery. And so he comes to Avery and tells him, you know what, the bank's asking questions. I can't cover for you anymore. You need to have the money back in 24 hours or else kind of thing. And he leaves, which of course pisses off Avery to no end. Um, Abby, in the meantime, breaks into Alex's lab and starts looking around and finds Alex's research notes. And as she's reading, we see these insects start scurrying across the, uh, you know, a mass of insects start scurrying across the, the ground towards her or across the floor. <clears throat> Lucilla, uh, Lucia, in the meantime, visits Avery to question him about Alec and, uh, who he knew and who he hung around with, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, he kind of gives him a, a song and dance, gives her a song and dance that, you know, oh, you know what? Uh, he was just some guy that I hired 
he just kind of blows her off. And then he goes, you're looking good. You're looking really good. And she goes, yeah, I know. Uh, and you tell, you say this every time that Maria cuts you off kind of thing. And just as they're moving in to kiss, we see that they've been fooling around that kind of stuff. There's a noise and she goes, Jesus Christ, is Maria still here? And he says, yeah, she's in the house, but she never comes down after, you know, after dinner. And she's like, screw this. I'm out of here. So Lucia leaves. Maria watches her from the upper window leave. And uh, as she's in the bathroom, you know, putting away some jewelry, we see Shauna in the mirror and she says, hello, mother. And the mirror cracks. We see the mirror crack. And uh, she says, do you think that father has been faithful to you all this time? He hasn't been faithful to you. Why does he keep you around? Maybe it's for something else. Yeah, her demon daughter. Exactly. Shauna is her is her demon daughter. Well, her spirit of her daughter, if you will. We don't know what's going on now with this. And uh, <clears throat> she tells her to shut up, you know, shut up. She covers over her ears and Shauna disappears. So Abby, in the meantime, is in the lab remembering her first drink with uh, Alec because she finds a bottle of whiskey. National Bourbon Day. There you go. And uh, <laughs> just as she's kind of remembering all this stuff, that's when she starts noticing the insects and she starts stomping on the insects a little bit. And there's a storm that's brewing outside. We see lightning and uh, some rain and there's thumping going on all around the, uh, the lab. So like the walls are thumping the wall, you know, the, the ceiling, all that kind of stuff. So she looks back uh, over at the window and she sees a face in the window and then the window crashes open and who comes in, but Munson, a reanimated Munson and asks in a kind of a, you know, dead voice where is he and she looks at him is like what the hell and as he approaches her and you know insects are flying off him she lights up a flare and holds it towards him and uh, he backs off a little bit but he's gonna go for her just then the floorboards explode and up comes swamp thing alec if you will and he tells her he tells uh munson to leave her is what he says and she moves in around be behind Alec and moves around the back of Munson, if you will, and grabs an axe and hits him in the back with it, which he just shrugs off. And as he turns to face her, he turns back again to face Swamp Thing and goes for him and then gets thrown against the wall. And then is kind of mewling afterwards. He's just laying there on the ground, kind of scared of him. And uh, Swamp Thing reaches out and touches him. And has another flash to that memory of this of the guy telling me he's going to kill him. And he tells the swamp, let him go. It's time to let him go. And we see the insects kind of fly off of him. And then his body kind of falls apart and turns to ooze too at the same time. Yeah, it, it was kind of really weird how he melted. It was, uh, it was cool and also creepy at the same time. But... Uh, she ends up talking to him and saying that uh, Susie said that you were you were Alec, that you were Alec uh, Holland. And uh, she goes, do you remember what happened? And uh, he says, yes, uh, burning. I felt burning is what he says. And then he starts remembering uh, who he was and he reaches out and touches her uh, hair like he did when they were in the lab there, when they were having their little night there together. Uh, well, not night, just when they were just hanging out, really. And uh, he says her name, Abby. And uh, she asks why the disease is fighting them. And he says it's not fighting. It's fighting back. So she runs back to the hospital. And everyone at this point is crashing. And uh, I kind of feel bad for uh, Tim Russ, who played Tuvok, of course, on uh, Voyager. Uh, he's just listed as Mirai, uh, Mirai Doctor. That, that's all he's listed as. He doesn't even get a name. And this is, again, another actor who uh, isn't bad in things. But, yeah, just to kind of be, uh, you know, called doctor. That's it. Hey, Ejar, how's it going? Um, so we see that Harlan is crashing as well. She comes in. He's at getting at the worst of all. And she calls for two syringes of immunosuppressants. And injects him of course to eli's objection eli is basically calling security to get her out of there and she ejects him with the two immunosuppressants and immediately it starts working as blood pressure starts going down 
he wakes up and she goes, do you know who I am? And he says, Nicki Minaj, I'm a big fan, which I thought was pretty funny. So she has it administered to all the patients. And of course, all the patients start uh, waking up from their little comas there. And she talks to Susie about Alec uh, and how she doesn't know how to help him. And she goes, yeah, he's, uh, he's hurt, but he needs help. She doesn't know, of course, how to do this. Maria, in the meantime, uh, is going back into Shauna's room. And who does she come in, run into but Avery? Avery's there waiting for her. And he says he's there to apologize. And But he's not really there to apologize. He's really there because he needs money for his research. And her family has money. So he wants to use her family's money in order to fund the research for the accelerant. Again, Shauna's prophecy coming true on this of her saying, what is she, what is she around for? And she's around for her money. And she says, no, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm cutting you off pretty much. And she walks away from him. Yeah. So Abby goes to the bar to go and have a drink, uh, the Bayou bar and Matt's there too. And, uh, Delroy, the owner of the bar, you know, uh, they have some really cheesy music, nineties music on the, on the jukebox and he puts it on and he goes, do you remember this? And she's like, oh God, prom. And he's like, yeah, prom. He goes, and I finally picked, I finally got up the nerve. And she was like, what? And he asked her to dance. Uh, and she agrees. She goes out and, and she starts dancing with him, slow dancing. And Swampy is outside. He can see her through the window. He can see them out the window. And she actually looks out and sees him. So, yeah. And he's kind of growling a little bit too, doing a little kind of, yeah, Natalie Merchant, exactly, Joker. It was, it was Natalie Merchant which nine you figure 14 years so 14 years she was in uh you know high school uh so what was that 2005 and natalie merchant why are you playing natalie merchant but okay whatever in the meantime daniel cassidy comes home uh to find madam Zan xanadu just sitting there in the dark waiting for him and uh you know, he's got his beer with him. She goes, you've been drinking again. And he's like, yeah. He goes, well, I finally found, you know, they finally got Red Stripe at the little, uh, you know, liquor store that I go to. Uh, and he can't leave this area. He says he's pretty much constrained to this area that he uh, arrived in uh, Murray, uh, Murray, excuse me, about uh, eight years ago. And he can't leave. Uh, and she says, well, you need to complete your mission in order to go home. This is all kind of cryptic shit. And he goes, well, can you do my card reading again to see if it's different this time? And so she does his card reading again. And it's the same three cards, but they're in different order this time. And he says, is there anything? She asks him, is there anything different? Have you met anybody recently? And he says, Abby Arcane. Is she the one I'm supposed to help? And Madame Xanadu looks up and says, Abby are, and she just stops and we don't know where this is coming from. So for those of you, again, who don't know who Daniel Cassidy is, he is the Blue Devil. Uh, the Blue Devil is an obscure DC Comics character who has been in you know, the Dark, uh, Dark Justice League, all that kind of stuff. So I'm kind of interested to see if they're actually bringing this in in the first season. I mean, it would be kind of awesome. That would be kind of cool to see how that goes. In the meantime, Margo is uh, out fishing pieces of uh, Alex's boat out of the swamp area, out of Skeeter Cove, and she finds a piece that has, you know, shotgun blast in it. And she immediately calls up Lizzie and tells her, you know, hey, I think he was shot, is what she says. She's the only smart one that actually picks up the phone right away and calls somebody in instead of waiting and then, you know, getting killed on the way back or bringing the evidence in. She actually calls it in right away. I was like, great. Thank you, Margo, for actually having some goddamn brains, because usually these people end up getting killed uh, when they don't do, you know, they don't give the information right away that they've found. Gordon comes home. Gordon Haas comes home and he finds a very angry and pissed off Avery. Uh, and he says, you don't come to my house and threaten me. And uh, Gordon picks up a golf club and, you know, is trying to protect himself. And Avery's just beating the shit out of him, but also still just. Uh, telling him, you know, you should be grateful for the opportunity that I've given you to come in on this, you little weasel. And he goes, you're going to cover the entire costs, is what he says. All the while he's hitting him and kind of pushing him upstairs kind of thing. And uh, Gordon steps, you know, basically stands up to him and goes, you know what, maybe I'll just bring it to the press about you and the conclave. This is the first we've heard of something called the conclave. 
And at that mention, Avery's like, you little son of a bitch. And he grabs the golf club out of Gordon's hand, knocks him out, takes him upstairs to the bathroom, dumps him in the bathtub. And Gordon wakes up and he's like, what's going on? He goes, why am I here? And he says, "Uh, because it's less messy this way. And he proceeds to bludgeon the shit out of him and kill him with the golf club in the bathtub. And then starts washing everything off. Uh, Of course, the doorbell rings and who's at the door, but Lizzie, because Lizzie knows that he's home. Excuse me, knows that Gordon's home because his car is outside. She keeps banging on the door, banging on the door. And Avery is just looking out the key, you know, out the peephole at her. And finally she walks away and he gets an evil glint in his eye at that point. And that's where we leave off on the episode. And yeah, he did sign his own death warrant pen farm girl with that comment when he said, you know, once he mentioned the conclave there, he was pretty much a dead man because you're not supposed to do that kind of shit. You don't let the bad guy know that you know about his big, big secret. Yep. Joker, yep, mobile phones were like in a in a bag back in the 1990s. Yeah, that was a giant. Yeah, exactly. They were giant bricks. Uh, I knew that tiny baker, uh, banker dude was done when he said uh, he would tell. Yeah, exactly. As soon as he walked into the house the first time to tell him you need to pay back that shit, he was dead. We already knew he was dead. Yeah. So, uh, and yeah, plus he was driving a maroon Prius. I mean, you know, he was dead from that. He, he was the, a red shirt. He was a red shirt that was driving. He was driving a maroon Prius. There you go. That's all you needed to do. Ah, yeah, that was a giant phone. Uh, well, yeah, she had a satellite phone is what she had going on. They make them smaller now. They don't have to be that big, quite honestly. Yes, they are. I mean, they have the giant antennae, but they're they're still good. Ice, yes, there you go. A little ice for you. So, yeah, so a good episode all the way around. I can't wait for next week. I mean, next week's going to be pretty good, um, especially if it keeps going like this. We know, okay, so for those of you who don't know the comics, I'm going to give you a little spoiler warning on this one. So you can plug your ears right now if you want to about Jason Woodrow. Jason Woodrow actually becomes the Floronic Man in the comics, which I believe is where they're heading with this as well. The Floronic Man is a villain in DC Comics, and he is a Swamp Thing character. So, yes, Uh, I'm, I'm actually good with that. Uh, and I mean, having the blue devil in there too, we get the supernatural side of it as well. And we've already got the supernatural side with, uh, Alec being in that other realm when he's, where he's seen, um, Munson at that campfire. So I'm wondering if they're going to bring in the, uh, otherworldly aspect of this, where there's another realm, if you will, that he goes into to, uh, talk to the swamp. It's basically the swamp, uh, talking to him kind of thing. And it's very interesting, especially in the Alan Moore comics. He did a very trippy thing. So uh, I'm actually good with it. Uh, EJR was once told by an attorney, don't be a rattlesnake and telegraph your moves. Strike like a mamba instead. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I might just watch the animated uh, just DC Justice Dark League. Yes. Uh, you know what? I forgot that was actually out. That's on uh, DC Universe as well. I remember now. So, did I miss anything when I was up there? While I was talking? The cards are reversed. Oh, ho. Uh, that was sweet that he remembered the prom song, but he doesn't stand a chance. No, he doesn't, Pen Farm Girl. I mean, Alec, even though they didn't spend a night together or anything like that, they they shared a drink, and that was enough. So, uh, yeah, Abby and him are now joined at that point. So, Penn, it went down after the little boy became big bad. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, he does have a bad for Abby. I, I Matt does have a bad for Abby. I agree with you, Viking bitch. Uh, they were kind of new age prog fusion rock, fusion yacht rock kind of thing. <laughs> Thanks, Ejar. That's actually a fairly descriptive term for that, I have to admit. 
Tim Russ Band. Uh, yeah. uh, Salem had a nice theme song for Mansion. Oh. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Pen Farm Girl, I joke, unfortunately I did. They told us to tune in at work to help the ratings. And after the first episode, they never mentioned it again. I don't think they knew what the content was. Uh, what was that? Uh, oh, okay. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, let's see here. I don't know if the Batman and Teenage Mutant... Uh, I heard it's good. Uh, a friend of mine who's really into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles liked it a lot. I'm going to wait till it comes out on like Netflix or uh, DC Universe if it's still around by that point. So it's not on the universe. Not yet. It's not on DC Universe. So. <clears throat> nice. So if you like what you see here, hit the subscribe button. Also hit the like button. If you're still on the fence about joining up, you're going to see a video that pops up here. The video is actually taken from the, all the stuff that you watch on YouTube. They know of all the nasty videos that you're watching here. There's no porn on here, but, you know, it's close to it. And uh, they're going to take the algorithms from all that stuff you're watching, pluck a video from my vast video library uh, that's close to whatever you're watching, and they're going to put it up here just for you. Over here is going to be my last video that I just did, which was iZombie. That'll be up here for you to take a look at as well. So, yes, tomorrow is going to be Saturday Morning Blast Off. Saturday Morning Blast Off is where I take the genre news of the week, talk about all of that, and any of the genre stuff you guys want to talk about. And that is at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And, yes, it is on the regular time. Last week was an anomaly just because I needed to go and do something, uh, which Pepper didn't even enjoy, quite honestly. She had none of it because it was too hot outside. She was looking for shade, and she didn't want to sniff any dog butts or anything like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, also, if you want to see what's going to be on my channel next, you can go to my website, suspenderfanimation.com, and you'll see the schedule up there. I repopulate uh, that schedule every week, but it pretty much stays the same. Monday, of course, is going to be uh, The Tick. It's the final episode or the final, final episode on Amazon, anyway, of season two of The Tick. And then, of course, the week after is going to be Legion. Legion season three starts on the 24th. Um, Tuesday, I'm off. Wednesday is Krypton. We're doing Krypton here. And uh, it's going to be episode two. And it's actually pretty good so far. It's a lot of fun. So come and take a look at that. Thursday is I Zombie. Friday, of course, is Swamp Thing, and of course, Saturday is Saturday Morning Blast Off. Uh, if you want to know when I'm going to be on live next, you can hit the bell down below here, and the bell will give you any notifications of when I'm on live. If you already hit the bell, don't hit it again. It will unclick it. You can go into the bell settings and get as many or as little notifications as you want from me. So I also have the schedule up on Facebook, on my Facebook page. I also have a Twitter. I also have an Instagram. The Instagram will become lively during Comic-Con which is in a scant couple of weeks here. Uh, actually, in about a month is really what Comic-Con is. And let's see what else. I also have a Patreon as well, and I don't have the tiers set up as of yet, but you can go and take a look at the Patreon page there. So, with that said, there's a lot of things going on here. Ooh, anomaly, such as such a science fiction word. It's actually a science word, Slurmy. Anomaly. That means we don't know what the fuck it is, but it's, uh, you know, kind of fascinating. Dennis is everywhere on the interwebs. I am. I am everywhere yet nowhere. <laughs> I am the Alpha and the Omega. Oh, there we go. And have all those uh, religious rights groups picketing me now at this point. I am so excited about Legion. Twitter has been teasing me with sneak peeks. Yeah, I've been avoiding those sneak peeks, uh, Viking Bitch, exactly for that reason. I don't want to be tainted by anything. And I just want to um, come into it fresh, quite honestly. I want to take a look at the last couple episodes of last season before I start again. But uh, yeah, I think that's going to be it. And just so you guys know, I have been watching uh, Good Omens. I'm probably not going to do a review of it because I'm not liking it. It's uh, it's like a... Uh, does everyone remember Beatlemania? Uh, where they had 
some guys that look like the Beatles that were performing Beatles songs, but they weren't that good. And uh, yeah, where they kept trying to push it because they wanted to push more money through things. This kind of reminds me of Monty Python, but uh, with none of the original actors and uh, none of the original writers. And it's kind of in the same vein, but uh, yeah, it just isn't doing it for me. I literally fell asleep really, really hard during the uh, third episode, about middle of the third episode. I'm going to stick through it till the end, Slurmy. I mean, uh, I'll watch it and get through it. it. It's fun. I mean, the only thing that made me laugh, quite honestly, out of all the uh, the three episodes that I saw was Shem, the unicorn. He's running away. Uh, you've got one last. You got, you've got one anyway. That was the only thing that made me laugh in the entire thing. So far. Everything else I was like, eh, okay. Uh, is do this production or the book? No, it's just um, it's it's a poor imitation of Monty Python is really what it is. I see where it came from. Um, it has it. That's where its roots are. Its roots are in Monty Python. Uh, Monty Python sketches things like that. It's the same kind of humor. It's the same kind of dryness, if you will, but it's not done as well. It's it's fine. I mean, if you've never seen Monty Python before, it's great. But um, I've seen enough Monty Python in my life that it just doesn't uh, it doesn't float my boat. And I mean, the leads are, are perfectly capable uh, people. It's it's fine. I tried reading the book. I actually have the book someplace around, uh, maybe behind me or in the bedroom. I don't remember. I have another bookshelf in the bedroom. So yeah, it's uh, yeah. And I didn't get through that either. But then again, I'm not a big fan of Neil Gaiman. So there you go. Yeah, I know. Sometimes I buck the trend on things uh, there, Joe Greer. And I know people question, you know, my, my geek card and all that kind of stuff just because I don't like things. It's like, hey, you know, as I say to everybody else, everyone has a difference of opinion on things. If you don't like it, you don't like it. It doesn't do it for you. It happens. That's why we're all different. That's why we all like different things. So I see how you are, Dennis. What Viking Bitch says, "Yeah, I am." So isn't there the twentieth anniversary of something coming up here? <laughs> exactly, Jugger. Variety is the spice of life. We won't question the geek card on this now. Supergirl, yeah, Supergirl. You guys can question all you want on that one. I don't love it. I just kind of like some of the things on that. Uh, no, you're, you're right to question me on that one, Pen Farm Girl. I mean, by all rights, I should be hating that thing. And I don't. There's uh, some stuff in there that uh, is okay with me that I like. <laughs> I need to finish. No, you don't need to finish Supergirl Joker. Just skim. That's all I say is skim over it. Only almost a fan of his due to the fact that he uses the same fountain pen I do. Uh, oh, uh, you mean Neil Gaiman? Yeah, I'm, I I just wasn't a big fan of his writing. I never was. I don't know what it is. So, oh, the last episode? You need to finish that up. Uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't that good, Joker. It wasn't, honestly... They're, they're wrapping everything towards crisis again, which I'm fine with. Uh, Viking says, I can't watch Car Crash TV, but to each their own. Yeah, Car Crash TV is, is a different subject altogether. But Krypton is not Car Crash TV. Krypton is actually decent. It's got a fair amount of uh, story to it. I was actually going to bring the book out. I forgot about this. Um, so The Last Days of Krypton is what it's called by Kevin J. Anderson, if I remember correctly who, uh, if I remember now, he is on the outs uh, for something. I can't remember what happened. Uh, if he was part of Comicsgate or what it was, or if he was caught uh, um, sexually harassing somebody or something like that. But anyway, uh, the book Last Days of Krypton was a good book. This is kind of similar to Last Days of Krypton. 
Uh, even with Tiny Lo, he was only in it for a little bit, Viking Bitch. He was actually the worst thing of the episode for me. Uh, someone actually said, I thought the, uh, I, the, the accent that he had was Australian. And someone said, no, it was Irish. And I'm like, that didn't sound like Irish at all. It sounded Australian to me. And um, yeah, he's, he's, he's tiny. He's tiny Lobo. But uh, yeah, he kind of ruined the episode. It was good up until, and the one thing I kind of liked about that first episode that they did, they didn't rehash anything. They didn't handheld handhold the fan or the the viewer through the first episode to remind you of what happened in season one. If you didn't watch season one, you're pretty much screwed because they just kind of went with it and just kept going. And I was like, yeah, that's the way you should be doing things. That's actually good. I couldn't remember what the fuck the codex was. I had to actually look that up again because I forgot about it. Uh uh, that's not killing off a character, Joe Greer. Uh, I forgot to mention that last uh, last time. They did not kill off that character. Uh, remember what they were all talking about when they were what they were talking about in the tunnel before he got killed. And you'll have your answer right there. Uh, from the clips, it sounded Irish to me, which was jarring for the character of Lobo. Um, I'm going to say, Joe Greer, that it was a clone. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. It was a clone. That's all I'm going to say. Because it just, it seemed a little too set up. And uh, Lita was already talking about that it was something that she had set up. So that's not, that's not, wasn't him. Yeah. Uh, EJR says, I got pushed out of the audience for the CW shows by their poor choice in writing and villain victim selections. I'm tired of their laziness. Um, EJR, so it's kind of funny you should mention that because the same writers, uh, producers, and all that stuff are the same guys that are actually doing uh, this DC Universe stuff. So, um, yeah, Greg Berlante is the executive producer on Swamp Thing, Doom Patrol, Titans. He is also, all their special effects are all running through the same houses that are doing the special effects for all the CW shows. They are still doing those all those effects. They're just pumping more money into the ones on DC Universe than they are on the CW shows. So it's it's kind of funny just showing you by putting a little bit more money and blah, 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 if I can actually speak, a little more money into things, you can get a better production value. You bring back the episode count from 23 to 13 episodes a season. You know, you cut out 10 episodes. You can actually put in a lot more stuff. Uh, which is my argument for bringing these shows over to the CW and just shortening all the CW shows to 13 episodes a season. And that way you can still have all these shows and you can have a year long's worth of show. You're just not going to have them on every night. You know, you can have... Uh, you know, and you're not going to have them every year or you're not going to have them all year long either. So, well, you can't have them all year long, but you'd have to space them out. Just trying to give these a chance before blowing them off. <laughs> yeah. CW After Dark on the DC Universe. Oh, yeah. Uh, Black Lightning. Uh, yeah, uh, Black Black Lightning needs something else too. I don't know what it is. There's something missing on it. I was I was with it in the beginning, and then it just kind of lost me, and I've stopped watching it. And yes, I agree with you, Viking Bitch. Thirteen of excellent quality is much better than twenty-three of filler and people talking in hallways about their feelings. Balance, yes, balance within the dark side and the delight. You need. There is the gray. That is the Bendu. <laughs> Seriously, they need to, you know, they need to bring the Bendu into the uh, Star Wars universe, the, the movies. That's what they really should have done, is they should have brought the Bendu in and had the, um, I know I'm switching gears, I'm going over to Star Wars at this point, but hey, fuck it. Um, they really need to bring the Bendu in and have the middle of the road. Neither light nor dark, but the middle. And that is where you needed to go with these movies. Uh, especially if you're going to have uh, Luke 
getting rid of the Jedi Order at that point. Um, yeah. And it's not even great. Jedi, they're not Jedis. They are just Force users at that point. As he called himself the Bendu, that's what he was. The Bendu are the middle of the road. Do you read the Star I don't read the Star Wars books, Joker. Sorry. I I was actually in the middle of Aftermath, and I, I think I've put it off like eight months ago. It's still sitting in the trunk of my car. It's being rolled around left and right. Looks like crap right now. It's all dog-eared. Hey, Mr. Roboto, you came in just at the end. So... But yeah, we could talk about that tomorrow on Saturday Morning Blast Off. Hey, maybe we will. We'll talk a little bit about Star Wars. How about that? Uh, yeah, he does have a knack for showing up right at the end. <laughs> okay, fine. Almost kind of sort of Jedi-like. <laughs> yeah, the whole thing where they found... Uh, if you go back into Rebels and you see the temple that um, that they found or that, have, that has the Nexus you know, those nexus points, the, the roadways and all that kind of stuff, the crossroads, if you will. There was a story that was on the outside of the uh, the temple itself about a father, a sister, and a brother. And it's all the story about the first Force users. And the father is the middle of the road. The sister was the light. The brother was the dark. He was the Sith. So that was the whole thing. And that's what they should have run with in the movies, quite honestly. But J.J. Abrams with his ADD, you know, ADHD, uh, who didn't have a script, didn't have a plan in place. So, uh, no, they shouldn't have gotten 5,000 years before episode four. Uh, yeah, that was like 5,000 years before episode four. Exactly. Uh, HR. You're right. Uh, I used to like, I used to read the Star Trek books. Best one was when Spock goes back and appears on Here Comes the Brides. No kidding. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Less said about that, the better. So with that said, uh, take a look at the videos up here. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. I'm going to let you guys go. Thank you, everybody, who joined me tonight in the chat. Slurmy Scott, Ejar, Joker the Third, Mr. Roboto, Viking Bitch, Pen Farm Girl. Uh, who else did I have in here? I believe that's everybody who came in. And you who have stuck around this long, if you've stuck around this long, go take a look at the video. Thank you for joining. Uh, again, if you're still on the fence about joining, take a look at the video up here. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. I will see you tomorrow morning at 1030 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for Saturday Morning Blast Off. Until then, don't let the door hit your ass on the way out. Otherwise, you may end up asking at your prom date 14 years later just because you're too much of a chicken shit to do it, you know beforehand. Anyway, good night, everybody.